a contingency plan in place for now, but that's what I would what I would bank on for right now. Um, so that's all I have for club business. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I should have introduced myself, I guess, at the beginning. My name is Scott Langlis. I'm the president of the Rhode Island Beekeepers Association. Um, welcome all Rhode Island beekeepers. Also, uh, we may have had may have some attendees from the neighboring Massachusetts clubs. I, I sent out an invitation to Norfolk County, uh, Worcester County, Bristol County, maybe a couple others. So if you're joining us from one of those mass clubs, I want to welcome you. Uh, I'm really excited today about our speaker. Uh, we had her in person back in 2017. I've heard her at EAS over the years a number of times, read her books, followed her career. Uh, I used to get your free the freebie newsletter. Um, it will eventually re reappear. It's just a question of time. <laughs> Well, and you have so many irons in the fire that when that dropped off, I, I certainly wasn't surprised, but it was one of those, the kind of few, um, those online newsletters, there's so many out there. It was one of the few I would actually make the point to read because it, it had good stuff in there and it wasn't just a rehash of, you know, the same stuff you're getting from everyone else. Um, you know, so that's kind of a, a, a good segue, I think, because right now, obviously we're seeing so much online content out there. Uh, everyone is kind of scrambling to come up with ways to still offer information where we can't meet in live. There are so many, I mean, my inbox is so choked every day with webinars, Zoom meetings, you know, P PDFs being shared. It, the amount of information being shared right now is completely overwhelming to me. And I try to stay, you know, up to date on this stuff. Um, what we're trying to do in Reba is really cut, just blow all the chaff away and give you guys the best of the best. And what we have today is, in my opinion, the best of the best. Um, like I said, I've heard her speak a number of times. She has literally written the book on honey. If you have questions on honey, <laughs> go right to the source. This is it right here. I mean, if you have um, The Hive and the Honey Bee, the current edition, she wrote the chapter on honey. She wrote Two Million Blossoms. Um, Simple Smart Beekeeping. Uh, she's the current editor of a, a new quarterly magazine called Two Million Blossoms, which if you haven't seen, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, I, I mean, I could, I could keep gushing, but I think well, I'm just gonna <laughs> hand the mic over to Kirsten right now. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Kirsten Trainer. Thank you so much. Um, Zoom talks are somewhat different than live in-person talks and I end up sometimes feeling like I'm talking a little bit to myself. So please use the chat and I will keep an eye on it. If you have any comments, any questions, pop them in there. I will do my best to answer them. It lets me know you guys are actually still there and listening. Um, as Scott said, I have launched a new magazine. Let me see if I can now um, share my screen. Oh, go ahead. I think you have to let, Scott, I think you have to let me share it because it's telling me it's disabled. So I will share my screen as soon as I can. <laughs> there we go. The one we want to share. Go ahead from current slide. All right, let me see if I can still find the chat window for a moment so I have it. Um, chat window, where did you go? No. Nope. Hmm, it's not letting me see the chat, unfortunately. I don't think. Just a sec. Can I keep? Kirsten, if you like, I can monitor the chat window and I can just try to insert the questions when they come up. That would probably be best. Thank you so much. All right, so here we go. So as Scott said, I I'm uh, launched this new magazine called Two Million Blossoms. Um, it's $35 for one year. It was launched in January, 2020. And we have since then pub, um, published three journals. 
Uh, it's been called the Vanity Fair of Pollinator Magazines. And our goal with that is to inform, inspire, and entertain. I welcome you to go check it out at 2millionblossoms.com. The first issue is available entirely for free online. And the next two issues have substantial sections that I've made available um, online. It's printed entirely sustainable um, on sustainably harvest paper with biodegradable ink in a facility that is all wind powered. So I, I believe very much that having something in your hand, you learn differently than when you just read it online, which is why I have the emphasis on a high quality publication. It really is a coffee table magazine. And if you get a chance to see one, um, you'll, I think you'll just love paging through it. It's not just on honeybees, it is on all pollinators. And so there's some scientific articles, there's some fun articles, there's some science and culture and art. Um, I really encourage you to check it out. So I've been asked to sort of roll two talks into one, one on honey and how we can produce it as beekeepers, as well as a little bit of the health benefits of honey. So it really is so much more than sweet, honey and how to encourage production. The fruit of bees is desired by all and is equally sweet to kings and beggars. And it is not only pleasing, but profitable and healthful. It sweetens their mouths, cures their wounds and conveys remedies to inward ulcers. And this is a quote from St. Ambrose, the patron saint of beekeepers thieves and beggars. So honey, um, beekeepers are in very good company with beggars and thieves. Um, we, we do know how to choose wonderful company, um, but St. Ambrose was supposedly kissed on the lips as a young child by a swarm of bees that settled on his crib. And from ever since he had the gift of gab and was known for his oratory skills. So honey is really the world's first sweetener. It is two million blossoms in a jar. That's about how many flowers honeybees have to visit to make a single pound of honey. It is spring and summer sunshine put up as a winter larder for the bees to survive cold climates. And that is what has allowed honeybees as a super organism to expand their range into temperate climates and survive a long cold spell when there are no flowers in bloom. It was once worth its weight in gold and in the Middle Ages, you could pay your taxes in honey and wax, which although um, tax day was pushed out to July 15th this year, I very much wish we could still pay our taxes in honey every year. That would be substantially easier for beekeepers than forking over our hard earned money. Um, and it has been used in healing from the earliest documents. Some of the earliest um, written documents that we ha have are old papyrus documents um, during the reign of the pharaohs. And they would often, in their prescriptions, they had one papyrus that was dedicated to battle wounds. Uh, they would often list multiple ingredients. And so they would say, you can use this, or you can use this, or you can use this. However, whenever they would talk about honey, they would offer no substitute. It was basically, you had to use honey or nothing else. And um, they had pretty advanced surgery techniques back then for restoring um Broken, broken bones and even doing skin grafts date back quite a long time and they were treated with honey as well. So um, our ancestors, they believed that honey was worth risking a life. Here is a cave painting called the Man of Bicor, although it's quite an androgynous figure. This is from the Cave of the Spider in Spain. And the artist actually used an indent in the wall to show where the hive is. And then you see all these giant bees um, flying around the figure without stinging, and they're collecting honey into a gourd. And they've trusted their life to three grass um, braided ropes to come down this cliff. And even to this day, people still harvest honey like this in Nepal. Um, this was photographed by National Geographic. And these are Apis um, dorsata and Apis labriosa colonies. Um, those are the giant honeybees that draw this one large single comb. And beekeepers traditionally harvest this honey at night. They will light a bundle of reeds on fire and then drop them to the ground. And the bees will follow that light spark down to the ground and depart their comb. And so it's much easier for them to use these long poles for cutting off the honeycomb into a basket. They consume the brood as well. Um, this beekeeper was tricked by National Geographic or paid handsomely, I should say, to do this during the day so photos could be taken. 
Um, as I said, uh, honey really is 2 million blossoms in a jar. And so we really need vast acreages of blooming flowers. And here you can see lavender in France, canola or rapeseed in the top right. And then in the bottom left is a sunflower field I had put in as a pollinator meadow in, um, in Maryland. It was a seven acre meadow and the first year it was absolutely packed with sunflowers. And then on the far bottom right is alfalfa. Alfalfa is usually cut before it has a chance to bloom, but in some areas for seed production, it is allowed to go to seed and then harvested so that other farmers can plant alfalfa. And that makes a really light, very, very sweet, um, highly crystallized honey um, that really just tastes a bit like a brick of sugar. Um, and so there's a large potential for beekeepers to take advantages of these different varietal blooms, because when you have these massive blooms, they tend to be at very distinct times of year. And so you can harvest a honey that is predominantly of one floral source. And even if you live um, like you do in Rhode Island or anywhere on the, uh, in New England, it can be harder to get pure varietals because there's often a lot at, at, in bloom at the same time. But you can still harvest more frequently and then get a spring and a summer blend um, so that you have more flavors to offer to your customers. So what is honey? Honey, as I said, is nature's first sweetener. It's a global commodity that is worth about $2 billion annually, and it is one of the top 10 most adulterated food products. It ranges up there right after coffee and olive oil. Um, a lot of people will lie about the origin of the honey or they will blend honey with uh, other sweeteners. And in the United States, uh, it is no longer, honey is no longer a registered uh, food product in our Codex Alimentaris. And so there is no legal definition of honey in the United States. And so you can actually sell these honey sugar blends and call them pure honey, and there are no legal consequences, although there are now state-by-state -state initiatives where they are working to change that so that there are state regulations that you can only sell pure honey as honey. Honey is a super saturated sugar solution with aromatic esters, flavonoids, amino acids, and minerals. So what do we mean by a super saturated sugar solution? Well, it means that in the heat of the hive, and this is why bees always store the honey above the brood nest, there's passive heat then rising off that brood to help evaporate the moisture off of the nectar and turn it into honey. And in the warmth of the colony, the bees can actually store more sugar molecules in that solution than you would be able to do at room temperature. And honey um, is predominantly composed of glucose and fructose. And if you have more than 32% glucose in that solution, the glucose wants to crystallize out of solution. This is why when you extract it and then you set it down on a counter and let it sit, a lot of honeys will crystallize. That is the glucose that is now in this unstable solution wanting to regain stability. And so the glucose will crystallize out um, and depending on the crystal structure, they can be large or small. And whatever the initial crystal structure is, the rest of the honey will, will follow suit and either develop large crystals or small crystals. And so beekeepers can harvest this process by seeding a honey that they know is going to crystallize, um, for example, like a clover honey, with a finely crystallized honey early on, and then through a stirring process, make sure that they get a very even um, crystal structure throughout their honey. And that in the United States is often sold as creamed honey or finely crystallized honey. It is a food product that varies dramatically in color, flavor, sweetness, and consistency. It can go all the way from water white to really dark, dark honeys. The dark honeys are usually honeydew honeys as well as our buckwheat honey can be quite black. Um, and the flavor can be from very light and lemony, almost citrusy, which is very typical of our acacia or black locust honey. Um, it's black locust in the United States and other countries typically call it acacia, to that very earthy flavor of buckwheat honey. A lot of times buckwheat honey will actually have almost a foul smell of it, uh, smell to it, although the taste can be very molasses-like and is wonderful for grilling meats. And so, uh, if you explore the full variety of those flavor profiles, you'll find that different honeys suit different needs. And that they also vary drastically in medicinal benefits, depending on the floral nectar source and an interaction with the soil. But what is honey for the bees? 
For the bees, a hun honey is their winter larder. It really is what allows the bees to survive that long cold dearth where there are no blossoms, which traditionally is from about mid-September, early October through to about the middle of March, although we're seeing a shift now with global warming where our falls are staying much warmer, our bees are continuing to rear brood, um, which is difficult for them because that's traditionally where they rear their winter bees. Um, so long as they keep rearing brood, they will also keep producing varroa mites, and then they will also be flying themselves off and um, wearing out their wings and their energy resources, using up their stored fat body, um, where there are really no flowers available at that time of year for them. So climate change often means that we need to leave our colonies a little more honey than we have in the past. It really is a survival strategy for cold climates, and it's a carbohydrate rich food source of the colony. Honey, um, for it to be fully capped, is traditionally under 18% moisture. If it's below 17.8% moisture, it will never ferment so long as it's kept in a sealed container. However, honey is hygroscopic, which means that it will naturally pull moisture in out of the air. And so if you leave um, combs of honey, for example, in your garage in a damp place prior to extracting, they can actually, through that wax capping, pull in additional moisture, and then you are raising the moisture level of that honey, and it may no longer be below that 18% that you want for extracted honey. In the Northeast, a colony typically needs about 60 pounds of honey to survive that winter dearth. And I always like to tell beekeepers, you know, feeding your bees in the fall if they don't have enough honey. I typically in Maryland would start feeding in mid-August and I would feed a one-to-one -one sugar syrup. The reason is that mimics the nectar flow. We tended in Maryland not to have a fall flow. This would cause the queen to really ramp up her egg laying again because it's in August and early September that all of your winter bees are born. Those winter bees have an extra layer of fat body. That fat body produces a special protein called vitelligenin. And vitelligenin is what allows our bees to be both good nurse bees and long-lived winter bees. Unfortunately, as the research of Samuel Ramsey has shown, varroa mites actually feed on fat body and varroa mite levels tend to peak in August and September, right when our colonies are rearing their winter bees. So if you imagine the worst possible case scenario, that's pretty much what we have now with our colonies. They need vitelligenin to survive the winter. That is produced in fat body. Varroa mites are peaking right when our bees need those extra stores of fat body for going into the winter. So those mites are feeding on exactly what allows our bees to be long lived, which is why you'll often see colonies that looked quite populous end up dwindling in colony size in that late fall, early winter, and then not making it all the way through to the spring. And it's because they've used up a lot of their vitelligenin and so are just shorter lived than otherwise would be. So nectar is a sweet reward. Now remember ladies, if you don't wish to get pollinated, keep your petals closed. Tulip, Rose, and Daisy attend their first plant parenthood meeting. Um, Unable to move, plants have a problem, right? They need to find a genetic partner, they need to find that perfect mate, and they can't just pull up their roots, walk across town to the best bar, and pick up the plant next door, who happens to be hanging out there. So instead, they rely on pollinators. And so pollinators, to attract them, these plants produce a sugary reward in their gland, um, basically harnessing the energy of the sun, into their nectary, um, nectaries and then providing a small bit of nectar to attract pollinators long distances. Honeybees exhibit floral fidelity, which means when they go out on a foraging trip, they typically go from clover blossom to clover blossom to clover blossom, and they will ignore all the apple blossoms that are blooming at the same time. Whereas another forager from that same colony may go out to apple blossom, apple blossom, apple blossom on a single trip but ignore all the dandelion. And so due to this, they really, they make excellent pollinators because they tend to go from one plant to the same type of plant, helping this genetic transfer. And so plants, of course, um, have a mutualistic relationship with bees, but they also like to cheat a little bit. And so there can be microbes in the nectar that actually create minute amounts of alcohol or caffeine, 
Um, and honeybees, just like humans, are very susceptible to both. So nectar composition, to produce nectar, as I said, plants harvest energy from the sun via photosynthesis, and they convert that to glucose, fructose, and predominantly sucrose. They also add in aromatic esters to attract pollinators and minute amounts of minerals, vitamins, and amino acids. And we're finding out now that there's actually a lot of microbes living in plant nectar that will change that amino acid profile and make the nectar either more attractive to some pollinators or less attractive. The plants, as I said, are also um, really out to get the most bang for their buck. And so some of them will put in caffeine, which is typically a bitter substance. And so you would think it would work against attracting a pollinator. But pollinators like honeybees that um, drink from caffeinated nectar, when they return to the hive, they dance more enthusiastically. They like their cup of joe just as much as we like it in the morning. And I hope you guys all have a nice cup of coffee so that you can bear with me during this talk. Um, as I said, honey was once worth its weight in gold. In the past, it was rarely consumed as a sweetener. It was primarily used for medicinal purposes. And so through time, honey has healed infected wounds, softened skin, cured constipation, and even made an effective spermicide. They would mix honey with ground dates, which produces um, a large amount of lactic acid, which is still the main ingredient in spermicides sold in, in the pharmacy today. So nest architecture has a lot to do with how bees will collect nectar and store that and turn it into honey. And so here you can see both a wild nest without the bees and then with the bees still on it. And so you have these multiple combs side by side and they have a very natural structure in their orientation. And here you can see in a tree cavity, this is redrawn from a Tom Seeley paper. So usually bees will seek out a cavity that's about 20 liters in space in a tree, preferably about 20 feet off the ground so that they are out of the way of predators and are well hidden from sight and so are much safer. Towards that nest entrance, what they typically do right on that cold spot where the draft comes in, that is where they build their drone comb. Drone brood acts like a down jacket for the colony so that on cool nights, the colony can contract and protect the worker brood, sacrificing the drone brood. So the drone brood is, can, is beneficial to help preserve the heat in the colony. And then you see that the main slanted area, that is your general brood nest. I like to think of a honeybee colony is a little bit like a hard boiled egg. If you take a hard boiled egg and slice it down the middle, the yolk is your brood nest. That thin skin on your yolk is that arch of pollen that they store all the way around the brood. And then the white of the hard boiled egg, that is your honey storage area. So the bees typically store honey on the edges of the brood nest and all above it. And in between the honey and the brood is an arch of pollen. So when you pull a frame out of a colony, as you see here, this is a frame that comes out of your top brood box. And you can see that nice arch architecture, right? So there's your brood, there's your arch of pollen, and then there's your honey stores. So when we see our colonies in the, um, in the early spring, they would have an empty box on the bottom. This is in the two it would be the two top boxes. But let's say this is your typical nest configuration where they've brooded out into two brood boxes, right? So you see the brown one um, combs are predominantly in the center. Um, the ones at the top hat would have that arch of pollen and honey. Um, and your honey is typically stored on the sides and above. So if I wanted, as a beekeeper, if I wanted my bees to expand that brood nest, where would I consider putting an empty comb? Any ideas? Now you guys really do have to answer in the chat. I'm gonna take a sip of water. Think about if you wanted, if you had fully drawn empty comb, where would you think about putting it? Well, ideally we want the queen to expand her brood nest. And so if it were warm nights, we could actually put that fully drawn comb somewhere right in the middle or one or two out from the middle would probably be best. I usually don't put it smack down in the middle, but usually one or two combs over. And I would pull those two edge honeycombs up into my top boxes. And that would encourage the queen to expand her brood nest. 
If I wanted to add an extra super, what would I consider moving? I now want those bees to move up into that third box and start storing honey, but I want them to keep all their brood in those bottom two boxes. I might even consider using a queen excluder if I want ease in extracting. But ideally what I would consider doing is I would move my honeycombs up into that empty box on the top where I've now added this extra super. I would draw, give fully drawn comb in those two boxes down below so the queen has room to expand her brood nest and is not thinking about swarming. And I would put one frame of open brood up into my top honey super above a queen excluder. This will draw my bees up through the queen excluder because they don't like to abandon brood and this will get more and more bees to work that full super up above. And then when I come back a week later, I, that brood is now all capped and I can rotate it back underneath the queen excluder and pull up a frame of honey um, like that one on the edge left there in the middle box or in the bottom right box. Um, and that allows me to get the bees to come up through a queen excluder on a regular basis. Now I know they're gonna keep drawing honey and wax in that top box and all of my brood stays down below in the bottom two brood boxes and my queen still has plenty of room to lay. So I've given them more space and I've encouraged the queen to keep expanding her brood nest. Kirsten. Yes? Um, if I may. So in yeah. the in the situation you have here, you're using all uh, you'd be using like all mediums, say, or all deeps. Correct. I use all mediums. I prefer to use one frame size throughout my entire operation um, because that allows me to do much more management. Whenever you have two different brood box um, boxes, if your supers are a different size than your than your brood, it makes it harder on a management. Um, basis for a backyard beekeeper because you always have to manage on a box level instead of on the frame level. So, right, in our case here, um, I would say the most traditional setup is going to be deeps for a brew chamber and then mediums for honey supers. For hunting. How would you alter um, your plan here right. if you were using deeps with a medium? So, because now you can't move a brood frame up into the no. super to get the queen to come up. Exactly. Um, so it, it becomes more difficult. Um, what I would tend to do if I had that is I would probably start making um, a couple of nukes for myself so that I would pull some of those deeps out. And then you would, of course, already hopefully have some drawn honeycombs from prior years. If you don't have them, you're probably going to have to allow your queen to have full access into that super because bees don't like to go through a queen excluder to draw out comb they've never from foundation. Um, you really need fully drawn comb for bees to get through a queen excluder. But you would wanna kind of manage it on the same way where you provide the queen lots of space in your, two, in your brood box area and provide them with lots of drawn comb in your honey super. Because uh, remember nectar can be anywhere from 80 uh, to 50% moisture whereas honey is only 18% moisture. And so nectar takes up a lot more room than, than honey. And so you actually wanna give your bees more space because that nectar, they have to evaporate it down. And two supers of nectar turn into about two thirds of a super of honey. Um, so we, we tend not to give our bees enough space. Does that help answer it or? Yep, that's great, Kirsten. All right, so if I wanted to focus on honey production and I had empty drawn comb, I would, and this again, you could do it if just with deeps and mediums up above, but I typically give my, my queen lots of space in that brood nest area, which is represented here by the gray combs. Those are fully drawn combs, so she can keep brooding out. Oops, sorry. And then I put the those, if I have some drawn comb, but not all drawn comb, I tend to put those directly above the brood nest so that the bees will be encouraged to put nectar up there and continue to draw out the foundation on the sides. Some people will recommend checkerboarding where you put one full, fully drawn comb and then one frame of foundation and then one fully drawn comb. That works if you have a slow nectar flow, but I found that in Maryland where we often have a very, intense spring flow, what the bees will do instead is they'll 
fully draw out the already drawn comb twice as wide, right smack up to the foundation and ignore the foundation. And then you end up with these supersized combs that are very heavy, very difficult to extract. And the bees have it completely ignored the foundation. And that's just because there's so much nectar coming in and drawing wax takes a lot of time and energy. And the bees are just really eager to stuff it somewhere. And so it's easier for them to draw those combs out deeper than to, to draw new combs. Um, so you really, no matter how, what types of boxes you're using, if you're using eight frame or 10 frame, uh, a selection of medium and deeps or all deeps um, and, and shallows up above. I personally like to use all mediums. Again, that's so that I can manipulate my colony um, and rotate boxes from, I'm always pushing my brood nest down into my bottom two boxes to encourage the queen to keep all 20 frames down below full of brood and to keep storing that nectar up above. And so they will naturally tend to shift into the middle and move up. And so then you end up with this sort of like skinny long colony. Um, and I then push that brood down um, into those bottom two boxes. And I pretty much do that by taking what they build in the third box and pushing it down into the, the further reaches. So they have a brood nest across all 10 combs in the bottom boxes with maybe only a honey frame on each side, um, a honey or a pollen. And um, so in the spring is really, as soon as you start seeing daffodils, that's when your colonies are starting to expand. So when your temperatures are consistently above 55 degrees, that's when I start adding a drone frame to start for trapping for Varroa. And I don't use the plastic drone comb that's already um, got drone foundation on it. We don't give our bees any chance to build drone comb usually using standard foundation. So if you give them a wood frame with no foundation on the edge of your brood nest, right before that frame that's almost a full wall of pollen, they will almost always draw perfect drone comb for you. The only time they won't draw drone comb and draw worker brood instead is you, if you have a brand new mated queen. If she's just come back from her mating flight in the last two weeks, they will draw worker brood because they're not interested in drawing drones because they have a brand new queen. Um, you can use this drone comb to help monitor for swarm drive. So long as they're drawing it out big and fat on the bottom, um, they're content to stay in their box. When they start doing what you're seeing in this photo here, where it's narrow on the edge, they're not drawing it all the way out to the bottom, that's actually a sign that they're conserving their wax to build a new nest after they swarm. And so those bees are getting ready. They're already in swarm drive. And we need to give our bees space before they start feeling like they, they want to swarm, where they backfill the brood nest, where they start putting nectar because there's no space anywhere else into cells where bees have just emerged. They pop nectar in there before those cells are polished and the queen can lay an egg. And so when you regularly have uh, temperatures above 55, that's when you wanna reverse your brood chambers so that you give the colony space above and you push all that brood down into the bottom. And so usually a high body reversal, um, if you're running all deeps or deeps and a medium, um, when you see a colony come out of the winter in early spring, they're usually pushed right up against the, the inner cover. And so you don't want to completely separate that brood nest and you want to still keep them in contact with honey. And so in early spring, a lot of people will just do a reversal in the top two boxes and leave that bottom box empty. Whereas in late spring, um, you can then push your brood all the way into the bottom and, and then encourage them to continue moving up and store honey in that top box. Um, so here, if you just think of your boxes, and again, they can be mediums or deeps, however way you see them. The blue here represents your brood. The yellow represents whatever honey stores they still have coming out of winter. I run all mediums, and so I put my colonies into the winter with two, um, two the bottom two boxes of brood and honey, and a complete super uh, a complete medium all packed with honey that's how they go into the winter and so come february march they usually still have quite a bit of honey on them and they're not pressed right up against the inner cover i'd rather have them have extra food than not enough and so when you look at your colony that first time in early spring that bottom box will often be empty 
comb acts as a sponge for pesticides and all kinds of other residues. So when you see all those empty combs in early spring, take a look at each one. If you have those really black combs or you've had them in your hive for three plus years, it's really time to rotate that wax out. You can just pop out the foundation and then give them a clean frame of foundation. You can keep reusing the wooden frame, but you really don't want beeswax in your colony more than about three years. It just picks up too many pesticide residues from bees coming and going in the environment. And so I will push my brood nest and all of my honey down into those bottom two boxes, giving the queen lots of space. They'll continue to eat up into that honey. And as they eat up their honey stores in March and early April, when the weather is still quite um, varied and so they have a lot of cool days and they're brood, um, rearing a lot of brood in earnest now, they'll eat up space into that and the queen will continue to lay, but they'll always remain in contact with the honey. Early spring is really your, your knife's edge. You wanna make sure a colony always has at least three full frames of honey at any given time. That will allow them to survive about 10 days of bad weather, cold weather, and you want that in contact with the brood um, because they will not abandon the brood if weather turns bad and cold. And so they will keep expanding up and then they'll start piling lots of nectar into that top box for me, which I can then harvest. Um, well, I run, I run three brood, brood colonies. I've always been more set up for nuke production than honey production. And so I typically let my bees have three medium boxes for their brood nest. And then anything above that is for honey production for me. And so this is pretty much in right at the start of my black locust flow, how I want my colonies to look. I want my brood nest spanning three mediums and one full super ready for them to put lots of nectar. If I have fully drawn comb, I will actually give my colony two supers instead of one once the days are regularly warm and um, that major nectar flow is about to hit. Because as I said, nectar takes up about two, two times at least more space than honey. So you want to give them enough space so they're not backfilling that brood nest. So here you can see what a natural colony growth would be. In the wild, colonies are actually quite small over their winter. They're only about 5,000 bees. Then come late January, they really start brood rearing. Um, at first, it's just a small fistful, and then it will be you know, a couple of hands worth of brood. And so then their population very rapidly picks up. And so as soon as those maples start blooming in the early spring, those colonies are really ramping up their brood rearing and they have this huge jump in population. In a natural colony, they get up to about 25,000 bees. They then start backfilling that brood nest and then they swarm. And so then you lose and you're back down to that small colony of bees, which then builds up again um, with that new queen and the old queen and um, half of the workers take off to start a new nest. As a beekeeper, if you're set up for honey production, you wanna manage this so that they're not backfilling the brood nest and they're not swarming on you. And so what you wanna do is you wanna do your swarm management in early spring. Most of us tend to do our swarm management a bit too late. As soon as your daffodils start blooming, that's really when you wanna start thinking about swarm management, making sure your queen has plenty of room for brood laying, and that they have space above them to store that nectar. And so that way you have peak population of about 40 to 50,000 bees that allows you to do really nice honey production when your nectar's, nectar flows hit. So to manage that brood nest, you wanna encourage the queen to lay more. And you can do that by providing her with empty drawn combs to lay eggs. If the weather is warm enough and you have drawn combs, you can place it in between two brood frames. I typically don't put it right smack in the middle, but I would put it, you know, in frame position six or seven um, if I had 10 frames. Uh, so if you count in from one side, you want it about three, comb, three combs in from the outside edge. If you only have foundation, you want to add the foundation on the edge of your brood nest. So if you're doing a brood inspection and you go through your box, you'll often typically find a brood frame, a brood frame, a brood frame, and then at some point you come to a frame that's almost entirely pollen. That wall of pollen in that bottom box marks the edge of the brood nest. When the queen comes to that, she says, oh, here's the edge of my nest. She turns around and walks the other way. This is why you never wanna drop a pollen frame 
smack into the middle of your brood nest. The only place to ever put a pollen frame if you're trying to encourage bees to use it up is in a nuke. Um, if you have a really strong nuke you can, and you add a second story on it, you can put a pollen frame right in the middle of that second story, but the bees will use that up very quickly to rear the next generation of brood and expand into that second box. But if you only have foundation and you want to give the queen room to lay, you want to put that foundation right in between your brood frame and that pollen wall. Kirsten. Yes. I'll break in here for a second. Uh, we, we have a question. Um, yep. Do you have a tried and true, a, a tried and true method to determine when the nectar flow begins? Do I have a tried and true uh, method? Was the question? Yes. Um, so I, I I can't speak for for Rhode Island, but I know in Maryland that when the daffodils start blooming, that is when our spring nectar flow would start. And the bees are, are bringing in quite a bit. It, it's a good uh, three to four weeks before our major nectar flow. But that is really, I, I just find that once the daffodils start popping and blooming, that is really when you want to be doing your swarm management and giving your colony space to put nectar. It's a lot earlier than most people think. Most beekeepers wait too long. If you start seeing the bees drawing lots of comb between your boxes, or comb on the top bars, you're already a little too late. That means that there that there's lots of nectar coming in, and they're they're trying to find every little place to put it. Yeah, it, this is a question we get every year, and I think it's one of the ones that really stumps new beekeepers, especially. But there's there's no textbook answer anyone can ever give to how to know we're in a flow or not. Um, I mean, part of it is is observing what's in bloom. Part of it is observing the hive. Correct. But you can't just look to a, a calendar date or or say X, Y, or Z is in bloom in my yard. I know I'm in a I'm in a flow. It it's really taking the whole holistic view of it, in my opinion. It is. I mean, a, a really good clue if if you're a brand new beekeeper and you're having a hard time knowing if you're in a nectar flow. If you take out a frame and you give it a light shake and liquid shakes out, you're in a flow. Um, those days where you take a comb out and, and the nectar is spotting all over your shoes, you're in a major flow. That, that's the best advice I can give if you're brand new. You can take one of those combs and just give it a light tap. If you see sp splashes of liquid coming out, you're in a major flow. That's great. So, yeah. Um, I. I found that in most areas, once those daffodils start blooming, it's there's usually a that that's a really good sign that your spring flow is on. It may not be your major nectar flow, but that's where we want to start. Not in your first year of beekeeping where you just get nukes, because that that your only goal there is to build them up strong enough to make it through the winter. But in your second year of beekeeping, if they survive the winter, um, when when the daffodils start blooming, that's really when you want to start looking into your hive and making sure your queen has enough room because bees can start swarming really early um we tend to we tend to miss those early signs um so to encourage bees to draw out foundation you want to place it next to open brood but if you're still having really cold nights you don't want to be popping a lot of foundation into your colony you always want to make sure your bees have access to honey they have to have access to three frames of honey all of pretty much March and April, um, depending on how cold it goes in Rhode Island, where you are, it may be even into early May. A really good place to put foundation if you want them to draw it out is next to drone brood. Drone brood requires much more feeding. It requires more nurse bees to visit. And the drone brood itself gives off a lot of heat, which allows the wax drying bees to keep the wax flowing easily. Um, foundation, if, if you have plastic foundation, um, you want to get the, ideally the plastic foundation that comes with a coating of wax or melt your own wax and use a little paint roller to roll it onto your foundation. Um, you can also spray your frames down with sugar water, which will just encourage the bees to sort of check it out, lap it up, and once they're there, they usually stay and continue to work it. Um, if you're going foundationless, which a lot more beekeepers are doing. Um, it's, it can be difficult if you give them a whole 
10 frames foundationless and expect them not to draw a crazy comb. They usually will cross draw and it will be very difficult to get frames in and out. However, if you wanna slowly rotate more and more foundationless frames into your operation, you can place a, a comb um, between two already drawn frames, especially brood frames, and they will draw very nice, perfect comb there for you. Just remember when you take a frame out that's foundationless, you can't turn it the way you normally would with normal rigid foundation. The gravity will plop it right onto the ground for you. You have to always rotate it on the edge of the comb so that the wood is supporting it at all times. Um, so to encourage honey production, you wanna build up a strong brood nest without swarming. At the start of the nectar flow, you wanna push your brood nest into the bottom boxes. Use empty extracted combs if you have them and provide plenty of space. If you have fully drawn supers that you can put on your hive, go ahead and put on two instead of one if you have a strong colony. If it's, a, if it's one of those colonies that came through this, the winter kind of weak and it's just not able to really cover its comb, obviously don't go plunking two of them on, um, especially if you're in an area that's starting to have issues with small hive beetles. But on a nice strong colony, you can go ahead and put on two supers, especially if you've run um, queen excluders in the past and it's just pure white wax. Um, the small hive beetle aren't interested in that, nor are wax moth. Um, one of the reasons to keep running queen excluders is that then you have no pollen or brood in any of those honey supers. And so once you've extracted them, you can store them in your garage or in your basement with very little risk of wax moth. Wax moth is not actually after wax, they're after pupil cocoons and protein from the pollen, from the stored pollen. And as I said, you wanna super early. Most beekeepers super too late. So keep that natural order in mind and keep pushing your brood nest down to the bottom two boxes, which encourages the bees to put all that honey up above them, right? That's what they do in their natural nest is they keep their brood at the bottom of the combs and honey up and above them. And so long as you keep giving them space up above, they will keep trying to fill it. You can also under super if you're in a good flow and you, you're running queen excluders and they've drawn 70% of one box, go ahead and pull that box up one and put in a, a full super of fully drawn cones underneath it. They'll keep finishing off the ones up above, but now they see all that empty space and they'll start packing it in there as well. It's a little more work on the beekeeper because you have to pull up that partially drawn super and slide the other one in, which is heavy labor, um, but they'll finish that top one off faster that way. And then you can, you know, we always tend to think when you harvest honey, you have to harvest a whole box at once. A box of honey can be extraordinarily heavy. Uh, you don't need to wait for all 10 combs to be fully drawn. If you keep three to five colonies, go ahead and harvest two combs from one, three from the next, and three from the other. You now have a, um, an extractor full of honey and go ahead and extract those. You now have fully drawn comb you can put back on the hive that the bees will fill up again. You will use less equipment, less cost to you, and you'll have more honey varieties because you're extracting more frequently. So I was also asked to talk a little bit about um, two million blossoms and the health benefits of honey. Are there any questions that you want me to address beforehand on honey production before I dig into the health benefits? Nope. All right. Um, actually, Kirsten, um, we, we do have oh. one here. Um, oh, I can finally see the chat. There we go. Come back. Where'd you go? So, so this question from John. Um, yes. So is watching for blossoming equally important as watching temperatures to enter hive for post-winter management? Oh, uh, it's a really good question. So I tend to on that first warm day in spring where it's warm enough, I will, so that can often be in February, I will check on my hive and I will pretty much do the heft test, pop open the top and see where my bee cluster is. But I'm not gonna do a big manipulation in, in February or early March. Um, I really just wanna make sure they have enough food because starvation is beekeeper error, not honeybee error. We just don't have enough flowers for them anymore. Um, and it's your really big colonies that will sometimes go through their honey stores very quickly. Bees don't use much of their honey um, during the winter months until they start brood rearing. 
And then once they're brood rearing, they, the temperature goes from about 78 degrees in the colony up to 98 degrees. And they have to maintain that temperature regardless of the temperature outside. So that's where they really start burning through their honey stores. And the saddest thing is a colony that um, dies out in February covering 14 frames just because they were trying to brood, we were too much brood, and then they, you had a cold snap for two weeks and they can't reach the honey. Um, so that's really where you wanna make sure you go out, do the heft test and get a little food on them. Usually once the daffodils are blooming, um, I check my weather. And if it's going to have at least three or four days in the next week where it's above 55 and the bees can move, um, because that's the temperature where they can really break cluster. I will do a light manipulation of pushing the bees down into those two bottom boxes and making sure that my brood part is always in contact with at least three frames of honey. This way I'm giving them space to expand, but I'm making sure they're always in contact with honey um, so that they have food sources in case the weather turns bad. But yes, it's a question of watching the blossoms and watching the weather forecast. I will not do a whole lot of manipulations if I look at the weather and I see that we're gonna have two weeks of really cold weather, then I just leave the bees alone. You're better off not tinkering with them if the weather is gonna be very up and down, up and down, other than to make sure they have enough food on them. So, and honestly, that comes with experience. It's it's Teaching new beekeepers how to read their colony is probably the hardest thing there is because you open up a box and it's really hard if you're new to know, is this a really big colony? Do they look really healthy? It just looks like a mass jumble of bees. I've met new beekeepers who tell me, oh, I have this really strong colony and I go and look at it. And to me, it's very, very weak, right? And it, it, it's not even something I would usually invest energy in trying to, to save because it's it's on that point where it's almost not worth the effort. Um, but that takes experience. I mean, it's, it's just a very, the best advice I can give to new beekeepers is volunteer to help other beekeepers. Don't expect your experienced beekeepers to come and help you with your hives. You won't even learn as much. The best way to learn beekeeping is to go assist an experienced beekeeper with their colonies because they know what they're doing when they open their box and they already know what the colony has been through in the months before. And so they can explain things as they're going and you'll just learn a lot more working their bees with them than if somebody comes with no experience of your own colonies and then tries to walk you through your own colonies. The bees are always gonna be your best teachers and repetition is really the best thing to help you come up to speed quickly. And the best way to get lots of repetition is to help somebody who has many more colonies than you. Um, so, all right, so that was all on honey production. And now we're gonna delve a little bit into the health benefits of honey. And as Scott mentioned at the, uh, at the beginning, I wrote a book called Two Million Blossoms, Discovering the Medicinal Benefits of Honey. And I know it's slightly confusing because I now run a magazine also called Two Million Blossoms just with the number two instead of the letter two. And it's because I already owned the domain names. Um, and I wanted something that, that illustrated a need in, to improve our habitat, uh, which is why the magazine is called Two Million Blossoms as well. But the book Two Million Blossoms is broken into four parts. The first part explains the history of honey, why bees make honey, how it's made. The second section is um, honey for your health with each chapter dealing with another ailment like cough, constipation, um, allergies. Then the third section is all about the use of honey for wound care. And for wound care, we actually have the most amount of research because of the uh, surge in antimicrobial resistant superbugs that infect wounds where our antibiotics no longer work. A lot of hospitals are now using honey for wound care because when you apply honey, the first thing it does is it eliminates wound odor. It will often take away the pain from the wound. And then within about 24 to 48 hours, it eliminates that, that antibiotic resistant bacteria, allowing the wound to pass from inflammation into the first stages of healing. And I'll cover that in a little bit more detail. 
And then the final section of that book is Honey for Pets um, that delves into how honey is being used, everything from treating um, turtles that have been wounded by uh, motorboats to using it for hot spots on dogs and using it in the care of horses. So the foreword was written by Dr. Peter Mullen. Um, Dr. Peter Mullen it was originally from Wales and he um, moved to New Zealand when he was a young scientist. Um, and at first he was working actually on bull sperm, um, but then uh, somebody approached him about a project on testing the antibacterial effects of honey. And so Peter Mullen guided him to test three different varieties of honey. So they used the clover honey, they used the local manuka honey, and then they used a wildflower mix. And what they found was that the manuka honey was incredibly effective at eliminating bacteria. And so this really peaked Peter Mullen's interest. He unfortunately passed away in 2016, um, but before that he had published over 35 articles on honey's medicinal benefits. And he very kindly wrote the foreword to my book. I had a chance to meet him in New Zealand, and he really was one of the, the nicest, most generous men I've ever met in science. So um, honey is used for centuries for skin care, and they recently did a review um, that was published in the Journal of Cosmetic Dermatology, um, where they talk about the uses of honey. Uh, and in that review, they write, honey exerts emollient, humectant, soothing, and hair conditioning effects. It keeps the skin juvenile and retards wrinkle formation. It regulate, regulates pH and prevents pathogen infections. So honey has actually been used quite effectively as a face mask for people who suffer from acne. Um, I don't recommend using this much honey on your face. That was really just um, a stock photo I grabbed. You can use just a teaspoon of honey and you put it all over your face. You let it sit on your skin for about 10 to 15 minutes and then just wash it off with warm water. As it's drying on your skin because it's humectant, it's pulling moisture into your skin, but it, it will feel a little bit like you've been in salt water and that salt water has dried on your skin. But as soon as you rinse it off with with warm water, your, your skin really ends up feeling a little bit like a baby's bottom. Um, this was a study done at the Michigan State University where they showed that honey increased the growth and viability of good bacteria in milk. And so honey is um, both a prebiotic and a probiotic. A prebiotic means that it passes, some of the sugars pass in, undigested into your gut and help feed the microbes that the good beneficial microbes in your gut. And um, a probiotic is actually helping the flourishing of those um, good bacteria in your gut. So it, it functions both. It, it's both a pre and a probiotic. And so a lot, um, there's a long history of Greek yogurt and honey, and both of those foods really help establish normal gut health. And we're finding more and more research about how important the gut microbial um, inhabitants are for all kinds of things, everything from um, they believe now it's involved in, in Alzheimer's and, and a bunch of other diseases where you wouldn't really think gut health has an impact. Um, so it's, it's the new forefront of research is how to improve gut health. And just consuming honey may be one of, one of the best ways of keeping the good guys um, alive and well in our intestine. So in early America, most families tended bees in their backyards. And here you can see some traditional bee gums. This, they would just cut down logs that already had a colony in them, or they would take logs and hollow them out so that they would be lighter weight, create a hole and capture a swarm and install them into these bee gums. And so easily dispensed from any container, dry granulated sugar has relegated honey to an occasional use in a cup of tea. According to the USDA Economic Research Service, the average American consumes 43 pounds of sugar per year, 55 pounds of corn syrup, and just one pound of honey. So to illustrate that, here is that 50 pound bag of sugar that a lot of beekeepers end up buying in August and September to feed up their colonies. There is a giant jar of carol-like corn syrup and they all dwarf that tiny little jar of honey, um, which most Americans consume just one pound per year. It used to be even lower. It used to be one third of a pound. So Americans have actually upped their consumption of honey, but they still lag far behind most European countries. So honey for your health. The slight regard at this time paid to the medicinal virtues of honey is an instance of the neglect men show to common objects. 
whatever their value. And that seems like a very modern statement, except for the misspelling on the word show, but it's actually from 1759, written by Dr. John Hill, who put together a medical text. And so um, one of the problems with honey and why it hasn't been very accepted by the medicinal um, practice is that it's, it's considered old wives medicine, right? Um, and so as the medical profession emerged and became dominated by men, um, the traditional healers, the women who had knowledge of natural remedies and herbs fell out of favor. And they were often then sort of relegated to almost the witchery type. And so we've lost a lot of appreciation for natural products. Um, that is starting to reverse a little bit now with even pharmaceutical companies trying to find out traditional remedies, find out why those work. Um, often native peoples have very excellent knowledge of the berries and natural products in their environment. And so there's a, been a gradual shift and, and re-acceptance of honey for healing. Um, although most of the research conducted on the health benefits of honey has been done in Europe and in Asia and very little in the United States. So there's a really long history of honey for healing. For over 4,000 years, our forebears smeared honey liberally onto wounds to help speed recovery. All the way up through World War I, it was used frequently to treat both amputations and lesions. Part of the reason it was used on amputations is it creates a, a moist wound bed that allows the bandages to be changed more easily without them ripping all, all open all that new skin growth. Um, and the Russian doctors have used it throughout World War II. They used it for preventing infection and promoting healing. But then with the advent of antibiotics, of, of penicillin in the 1920s, um, honey very quickly fell out of favor. Although since mass production of penicillin, within four years, we had penicillin resistant staff. And so whenever we had developed antibiotics, new antibiotics, very quickly, we, we also have resistant bacteria as soon as we start using them in bulk. So how does the honey work? It works differently than prescribed antibiotics. Antibiotics typically poison the bacteria or disrupt their cell building mechanism. And so there's a very quick development of resistance, usually within four years of us having widespread use of any antibiotic. Whereas honey works in a multi-pronged attack. It's very acidic and a lot of bacteria don't grow well in acidic environments. It's also hygroscopic. Remember how I said it pulls moisture out of the air? Um, if you store honey, for example, on, um, still in the comb in your garage. Well, it does the same thing when you put it on wounds. It actually pulls the moisture out of bacteria and helps lyse the cells, um, causing those bacterial cells to pretty much, lyse is a form of type of um, exploding, that the cell walls break down. It's high in sugar, which again, uh, inhibits the growth of bacteria. This is why the high sugar typical jams and jellies um, tend not to get mold growth in it, whereas low sugar jams you often have to store in the fridge because mold will proliferate in them. When diluted, um, honey will still stop bacteria. It inhibits the growth of approximately 60 different species of bacteria. And here, um, that image that you see is actually an agar well plate where they have bacterial cells over the entire plate except for a little well in the middle where they put in the magnuca honey. And then they measure the zone of inhibition. So how far does that manuka honey annihilate the bacteria around that well? How far does it permeate in and destroy the bacteria? The bigger that zone of inhibition, the stronger, the more antibacterial a given honey is. So why does honey work? Well, in the 1930s, a curious named um, trio of doctors discovered that honey was very good at inhibiting bacteria but they didn't know why. And so they, this unidentified substance, because it inhibited bacterial growth, they called it inhibine. It wasn't until 1962 where Dr. Jonathan White, who worked for the USDA, demystified this baffling inhibine. And what he determined was that an enzyme that bees add to nectar to split the complex sugar sucrose into the simple sugars fructose and glucose. This enzyme is called glucose oxidase. When diluted, it forms gluconic acid and very minute amounts of hydrogen peroxide. 
Now we've known for many, many years that hydrogen peroxide is really good at destroying bacteria. The problem is when you put the store-bought solution on skin, it also burns the new skin cell growth. And so it's not very good for treating wounds. However, honey produces minute amounts of hydrogen peroxide at about one one thousandth of the level of the store-bought, but it does so continuously. So long as there are exudates from the wound, adding moisture to that wound bed and diluting the honey at the honey surface, you will have small amounts of gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide. So here you can see an abscess infected with MRSA. Um, MRSA is methicillin resistant staph, staph and so um, it doesn't, it doesn't, and no, it is now uh, resistant to one of the most common antibiotics, methicillin. And so you can see that around the wound bed, it's very red and inflamed. And you can see it's sort of puckered up a little bit. This wound um, will be chronic because it's stuck in this system of inflammation and the antibiotics are no longer working. So they treated this abscess with this honey gel that's available in Europe. And this is what the abscess looked like six days later. You can see that all that red inflammation has completely disappeared. So within 24 to 48 hours, that honey gel eliminates the bacteria. And then the sugars in the honey actually help feed the new tissue growth. And then the cells can migrate across that wound bed. And typically you end up with uh, fewer scars because there's no scab formation. When a scab forms, the new cells have to dip underneath that scab. And so that's why you end up with scar tissue. Whereas when they can migrate right across the moist wound bed, you end up with very little scarring. So why is honey superior? Um, this is a pu paper published uh, by, in 2000 by Dunford um, on the use of honey in wound management. And she wrote, the emergence of microbial strains with multiple patterns of antimicrobial resistance has reduced the efficacy of conventional therapies and forced the reevaluation of traditional remedies in the search for appropriate antimicrobial agents. And so because of all these superbugs, especially in the UK where they were really struggling with them, there has been an embrace of alternative methods. And those alternative methods include the use of honey in wound care. In fact, in, in uh, British hospitals, you can request that instead of standard silver dressings, your wounds are treated with honey. And so I apologize if you've just recently had breakfast. Um, this is a newborn baby. It was born with a wound to its open back that was then infected with three different um, superbugs that were resistant to antibiotics. And so for the first month of its life in neonatal care, um, they tried with antibiotics to get this wound to heal and nothing would work. It just remained, uh, remained infected and really puffy. The mother happened to learn that a doctor in the, um, in the same hospital in a different unit in a pediatric oncology unit, Dr. Arnie Simon was treating his immunosuppressed patients, um, their catheter wounds and any other wounds that they developed with a Manuka honey gel. And so she requested that her baby be transferred to his care and that they treat this wound with Manuka honey, which they did. And then two weeks later, the wound became that. So babies have an incredible ability to heal as soon as you move a wound out of that inflammation stage. And so with that, that giant wound was able to seal itself down to that tiny little nib within two weeks and the child was released home for the first time in its life. Um, it's also very effective against diabetic foot ulcers. This is just a case study where they used 12 patients. And often we, we hear about Manuka honey and wound care, but here they just use natural honey that they purchased at the, at the market. And on average, these diabetic um, foot ulcers healed within three weeks and it reduced the wound care costs by 75%. Diabetic foot ulcers are notoriously difficult to heal because diabetics often have very poor circulation. And one of the things that's required for wound care, for wound healing, is that you need a lot of blood flow to the area. And so when you have very bad um, blood circulation, as diabetics often have, often your wound healing will fester and these wounds can smell quite foul, which then stops people from socializing as well. And so they found that when you use honey for wound care, um, the patient is even before it, it heals, the odor disappears. And so they're much more likely to resume their social activities. Um, and that is all I had to say. So thank you very much.
If you want to reach me by email, it's editor at 2 millionblossomscom I'm on Twitter under Bewitch B. I'm on Facebook for the magazine at facebook.com for um, 2 million blossoms and also on Instagram. I'm actually hosting a Facebook live event tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. on that 2 million blossoms page where I will be talking about urban beekeeping and talking about beekeeping here in Berlin and some initiatives in the United States. So thank you very much. I'm now happy to take any questions you might have. Oh, and I guest host the Beekeeping Today podcast. If you like the information you hear from me, um, you're welcome to check it out. I host it every other week. Um, and I've had a chance to talk with Tucka Seville, Megan Milbrath. I just did one with Adam Ingrail on his uh, Heroes to Hive program about integrating veterans into beekeeping. And so it's a, it's a great show. I had a chance to talk with Dave Goulson and uh, there's lots of other great interviews coming up. So happy to take any questions. Thank you, Kirsten. That was excellent. As welcome. Always. Uh, that's actually a great, uh, a great introduction to the fact that we are hosting Megan Milbrath in September. Oh, uh, awesome. She's a great speaker. Zoom. Yeah, she was on my wish list for a long time. Um, you know, I actually I spoke to her at the last EAS and she said she doesn't really travel much. Maybe she'd be willing to do like an online thing like this. And at the time I thought it was, you know, maybe kind of a half-baked idea. And it, you know, I was picturing us all assembled in our typical meeting with a hundred people watching a screen and I just couldn't really see the the logic behind it. But then obviously the situation we're in now, it just seemed like such a perfect opportunity. Um so I'm really excited to have her coming in September. She, you guys will love her. She, she gives great talks. Um, so I'm just scanning through the chat right now. I'm trying um, to find the chat. I don't understand what happened to it. <laughs> Maybe I have to stop sharing my screen. There it is. Hi, everybody. <laughs> lots lots of applause. Abdominal burns time. for 30 years. Wow. Very cool. Yeah, I can say, you know, I personally am a diabetic. I'm a, I'm a type 1 diabetic since I was 8 years old. So I've been, you know, I've been dealing with diabetes for over 35 years. Um, I'm like a religious user of honey ointment. Um, yeah. Um, Cindy Holt, that many of you know, she makes uh, a nice... Um, you know, a nice ointment. Um, so I don't have to make my own, you know, I just, just the other day, my, my cat scratched me on the foot. Um, I'm a very slow healer. I put that on there, you know, cleaned it up, threw some honey ointment on with a, with a bandaid two days later. It's like, you literally can't even see that it was ever there. Um, so I, I swear by it personally. Yeah, it, no, it is. It's an amazing substance and all honeys have medicinal properties, especially if we don't expose them to light. So glucose oxidase is very light and heat sensitive. So if you're extracting your honey, you want to avoid heat. And then when you're storing your jars of honey, you don't want to leave them sitting out on the table in lots of daylight or fluorescent light. You really want to keep them in the cabinet. Yeah, and I think I remember this from an earlier presentation you did that, um, you know, Manuka obviously has the, the reputation right now as like mm -hmm. the, the big healing honey, but really all of our local raw honeys, if they're treated properly, stored properly, can have, you know. Correct. So um, manuka, manuka honey has methyl glyoxal, which is heat stable. And that's why it's used in wound healing because they can heat treat it and gamma irritate it. And it, so they eliminate any potential for botulism spores or anything else. Um, however, all honeys have glucose oxidase so long as they've been properly processed by the bees and not extracted um, with too high of a moisture content. Some honeys will have more glucose oxidase uh, than others. In the United States, some of the best honeys for wound healing are, are buckwheat honey, especially from Illinois. And um, according to research from Wisconsin, soybean honey, although it's rarely ever sold as soybean honey, it's usually sold as wildflower honey. Um, but soybean, for whatever reason, whatever way the bees process it, also ends up having a very high glucose oxidase content. That's great. Um, yeah, and I mean, you know, one, one thing we've kind of been talking about as, as a group over the last few months, um, you know, proper honey labeling, proper honey extraction, um, you know, treating the, 
treating the product with the respect you know that it really deserves right um, it, i mean it's important for a number of reasons economic you know perception wise but if you're planning on using it in a medicinal fashion um you know it just underscores the need to you know you want to have it extracted at the proper moisture content you want to store it properly um you know and it just it, it's something I, I i don't think we can put enough um enough emphasis on personally uh i mean especially like the the situation we're in now with covid you know we, we saw especially at the beginning there were problems with um you know shortages in markets you know yes. shipping delays yes. uh you know supply line uh disruptions i mean we as beekeepers i mean I, i'm gonna i'm gonna play cheerleader for the beekeeping community here a little bit i mean we're in such a position right now to uh you know, strengthen our, our local communities, producing this perfect food, but also something that has these medicinal benefits. Uh, I mean, really, it's such a unique opportunity for us, I, I think, um, you know, to, to bolster our communities and, and act as real assets. Um, yeah, I, I fully agree. I mean, if there's ever an apocalypse and, and we turn into a barter economy, beekeepers are going to be really well set because a honey beehive is its own little pharmacopoeia, right? I mean, so, we... If, if you think about it, you have 30 to 50,000 individuals living together in a hot, humid environment where normally bacteria would flourish. But all of the products of the hive are really designed to minimize bacterial growth. So there's propolis, which is antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral. Um, the beeswax itself is an excellent material as well. Um, the bee bread is protein rich, and then the bees coat it with a little bit of nectar so that it has a, a minute amount of fermented food at the very top that helps preserve it. So yeah, I mean, nature and evolution do a wonderful job of figuring out solutions. And I mean, you don't get a much more densely inhabited population. And for the most part, except for Varroa, bees are able to keep themselves quite healthy. Um, so there's been a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, one of them from Ann was wondering if you favor requeening a colony or allowing the colony to requeen itself. So um, when I was living in Maryland, I used to rear my own queens and I would preferentially rear queens off my colonies that lived for two or three years with the same queen without swarming. Um, the reason for that is they were surviving in my organic management and they were staying in the box. So they weren't having me chase them out of trees. Um, those queens, the daughters that I raised off of them, they would often last two to four years. And what was really nice is they would requeen themselves through supersedure processes. Um, so it was not uncommon for me to find two queens in a colony, mother and daughter in the same hive, and then eventually the mother would disappear and they would just have the daughter. The, this is the best possible type of requeening because the bees pretty much get the benefits of two queens until they know queenie, baby queenie is working out perfectly well. And then they get rid of mama queenie um, because she's sort of come to the edge of her, end of her usefulness. However, if I have colonies that are hot, testy, mean, have disease issues or any other problem, I will immediately pinch that queen and then decide what I do with the rest of the bees. I don't tolerate mean bees and I don't tolerate sick bees. Um, so, for example, if you run five colonies and three of them are doing really well or, or normally, one of them is a boomer and you have one colony that's just poking along behind everybody else, um, for me, because I'm, I've always been set up for nuke production, I would eliminate that queen and I would not allow that hive to requeen itself. I would give that colony a new queen from better stock. Um, so the, when people ask me, do I allow colonies to requeen themselves? I never do walk away splits because when you do a walk away split, you lose about a month of, of bee production during that time. And they don't always successfully requeen themselves, but I'm, I'm able to rear my own queens. And I always, and I highly recommend if you're a beekeeper with at least two years of experience, make yourself a nuke in the spring or early summer. It's easy to find an alternative queen, or if you have a colony that is drawing queen cells for you anyway, you could make a nuke with one of those. Um, just remember that if all of your queens are made from swarm cells, the one thing you are definitely selecting for in your population 
is the tendency for the colonies to swarm. So grafting is not as hard as, as people think. Care of queen cells post grafting is much harder than the actual grafting part. But I highly recommend that beekeeping clubs as a, as a collaborative initiative do more queen rearing for local queens in their own area. Um, so I tend to requeen, except in the case where colonies supersede themselves, that is, that is the perfect way of requeening. Those, those colonies get to stay and do their own thing. Um, so, ooh, thank you, Janice. Janice came all the way and she, she came to my queen catches in Maryland and she, she is the proud owner of some Maryland mutts. As I say, all of my queens are, are open, open reared, um, open mated, sorry. I graft and then I let them mate up. Uh, I prefer carniolan stock in my own colonies, but since they're open mated, they are, they are definitely mutts. And so I end up with all kinds of stripy bees. And often when you go into my colonies, you'll see some very black bees. And then you'll see some bees that have black tips on the end and then some stripy ones as well, just because they're, they're extremely well mated. But a lot of people in, in the valley I was kept Italian. And so you would end up with, with wonderful mutts. Um, somebody asked how I use propolis. I uh, make my own tinct tincture of propolis. So the best way to do it is scrape out all your propolis or use a propolis trap. Um, freeze your propolis so that it's hard and, and you can actually then grind it. Um, you can dedicate a coffee grinder to it, but whatever you grind your propolis with, you will never get the propolis out of. So it do not try to grind your coffee beans after you've ground propolis unless you like the taste of propolis in your coffee. Um, and then I make a tincture. You can do that with any type of high proof alcohol. I tend to do it with gin. Um, and so I take my ground propolis, put it in a jar with gin, um, let it sit and marinate for at least two weeks, shaking vigorously every, uh, every day for a minute or so, uh, storing it in a dark container. And then you can filter it through a coffee filter um, and that is wonderful propolis tincture. Or you can let it keep soaking in there and just take the alcohol off the top and keep. Um, if you put propolis tincture in water, it will ruin whatever glass you put it into, but you can use the eyedroppers and just put it straight onto bread. Um, and that's probably the easiest, cleanest way to consume propolis. Some people mix it into creams as well. Okay, well, I don't see any further questions, Kirsten. I, I want to just thank you again. It was a real pleasure uh, talking to you today. Uh, you, have the, you have the distinction of being our first international guest. Uh, I forgot to mention it in your introduction, but Kirsten is actually talking to us from Germany today, uh, which was one of the reasons we were having this meeting earlier than we typically do. Um, you know, I think you said you're six hours ahead there. That's correct. It's 530 here. So I, again, I just want to thank you, um, you know, informative as always. Uh, for those of you in Rhode Island, um, Kirsten's books are available as part of the Reba collection at the Greenville Library. Uh, I also encourage you to own them. I personally do own them because, you know, I'm kind of old school. I mean, you can find anything online, but I like a, a book in my hand and I find myself referring to those books all the time. Um, I mean, in my opinion, there's, if you're looking for info on, on the medicinal values of honey, uh, Two Million Blossoms, I mean, that's your textbook right there. Um, but those books are available through the library. I encourage you to check them out. Um, and thank you once again. So my pleasure. Please do uh, check out twomillionblossoms.com if you like. Uh, like I said, the first issue is available. Subscriptions mean the world to me. I'm trying to grow the subscriber base so I can keep producing it. Um, it's a really high quality print publication. And I have a new website where you can find all of my um, published scientific articles. I'm getting all my lay articles up there as well. And that's called bewitchingbeekeeper.com. Um, so lots of information there. Here, I'll put, it, I'll put it in the chat so everybody has it. And we do have those links on the okay. uh, Reba Facebook page already for those of you who follow us there. Thank you. All right. And with that, I'm going to wish you guys all a happy Saturday. Uh, try to stay cool if you're working bees today. It's going to be a hot one. So we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you all for showing up. Bye-bye.